Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with Spending Time, the Blog to Watch podcast. I'm here with special guest Matthew Gallagher, the founder and CEO of Watch Gang. Matt, good to have you here. Thanks, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me on. We're in my office. You know, this is the first time I've done a podcast with someone sitting next to me in my office. Is it usually in their office? It's usually in a shady hotel room. That sounds fun. It's usually in Switzerland. It's fun. No, no. <laughs> uh, no, usually it's remote. So that having like an in-person conversation is kind of a cool thing. I like it more. So uh, you were just admiring my um, my watch here. You Your glass shoot. My glass hutta. Glass hutta. Which actually just stands for glass house, even though no one, even in the town, knows why that is. Well, it's because you're not supposed to throw rocks. Maybe. I, I don't That's know. That's a thing they say in Germany. I don't know. So you, you like this watch. You I do. You admire this. Now yeah, you, that's cool. You make a business by selling a lot of watches to a lot of people. Um, do, you, do you ever ship out watches like this? Um, yeah. Yeah. In our centum tier. This nice. Yeah, I mean, what's the retail on that? This retailed for more than 10, I think. More than ten hundred dollars? Uh, ten thousand. Not quite that nice. Not quite we, that we've, nice. We've we've uh, we've sent out watches that retail for more like three or four thousand dollars. That's been the top one. In, in our centum tier, yeah. So I think a lot of people on the show um, may not be familiar with Watch Gang. Okay. And I want you to tell our audience. And remember, these are people that that know their they know their watches. There's a there's a high there's a high level of a. Uh, um, discriminating consumer uh, that's represented in our in our demographic. Well, then they are going to highly respect our thirty dollar a month watch. Tell plan. us about that. Okay, so uh, I started Watch Gang uh, about fifteen months ago um, with one one tier. It was thirty dollars a month, which well, gets let, you. Let, let's yeah. back up and explain to everyone. Okay. What what the business model is? I'm fascinated. But I love this stuff. Okay, so it's a it's like a lot of like um, monthly subscription boxes. You get something of higher value than your membership uh, fee. So it's a watch of the month club. You get a new watch that you keep every month uh, to help build uh, a collection. And we started it at a $30 price point because that's where we felt we could kind of gain traction. Um, and as we grew, uh, we started adding higher valued watches. And that, that came as a result of our members asking for better quality and and you know uh, more diversity in in the product. So we have the thirty dollar a month uh, watch club, which basically gets you a watch worth fifty to one fifty, and that's real world price, not MSRP. Um, Hundred dollars gets you a watch one fifty to five hundred, and then three hundred dollars that's our watch gang platinum that gets you a watch that's worth five hundred to fifteen hundred, which I think your audience probably respect a bit more, maybe a lot more. For sure. I mean, you know. As you mature as a watch lover, which I think you're doing right now, because when you got into this, you told me you didn't, be, you weren't a watch lover to begin with, which I think is fascinating because this is this is so inherently about appreciating watches. How did you even get into this, not being at least what we would call traditionally a watch lover? Yeah, I was. I mean, I I grew up with you know I, I had a calculator watch and I had a you know um, like a Casio that lit up and had an alarm on it which I was obsessed with growing up because I was you know it's just a being a kid with something like that uh, on my wrist but um, it wasn't until my my dad passed away in April of 2016 and left me a watch um, a 1953 uh, Rolex uh, Oyster Perpetual and that showed me how much more a watch could be to somebody than just some you know utility to tell time or even a something to go it's along really with their interesting how often I hear the exact well not the exact same but a similar story where somebody got into watches because their father after having passed away so not even during his lifetime gave them a watch that then forced them to look into what it was maybe get it repaired and it was because of that experience that they were aware of the watch world and if it isn't for this sort of foundational experience a lot of people especially in america can just pass over this i'll just call it a hobby altogether you 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 reach a lot of people that i think represent that right they, they didn't start out as watch lovers what do you think it is that gets young guys in america today into watches what well, are some of the, the major criteria it's it's hard right now and that's mostly because of iPhones and Apple watches, right? I think that that made it a lot more difficult for um, new and young people 
to experience uh, watches because they were generally used for utility before, right? And then at, with the rise of technology, they're, you know, half of our members don't use a watch to tell time. They use it because it complements their wardrobe. And what we're doing and what we're trying to do is, uh, is continue growing and usher in a new sort of you know, uh, audience of, of watch lovers. So uh, uh, let's, let's take an example for a standard member of ours who might start off um, with a lower risk, spending $30 to get a watch that is it's obviously a fashion watch, something to complement what they're wearing, I see you smiling because you hate it, <laughs> and that's fine. I don't hate it. It's just the term fashion is used so lightly. Okay. I mean, what what would you call a watch that retails for 100 bucks? Well, we're not... T okay, so $30, they're, they're, they're getting a watch that retails for 100 That's or, the idea? up to 150 So Okay, so I've been in the office. I've seen some of these characters. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with spending that amount of money on a watch, but it is this weird price point where a lot of companies put in stuff that costs dollars to make, right? So you can get an amazing watch for 150 bucks, or you can get something that like is falling apart in front of your eyes. Sure, so obviously we have a, we have a team of people that go through uh, and curate those watches. Do they use samples. hammers? Uh, we throw them on the ground. Do you really? I've, I actually have, I've smashed a watch with a hammer because I was upset that we sent it and I, I wanted to send that picture of the smashed watch to a member to show him that I empathized with him. And this was way early on. I mean, I've I've become more knowledgeable and grown as a watch lover through running this business. I didn't know much about watches, but I'll give you an example of a partner that we had in that level that maybe is a bit respectable to you and your audience. Uh, that's Pulsar, right? Which is a division of Seiko. So it's a solar powered chronograph watch, you know, with the quality you'd expect out of a Seiko for $29. Where do you buy, where do you get that? Because they've been able to amortize the cost of the development of that movement because it came out in, in the early 90s, maybe. So what they're able to do, and that's what's great about certain types of manufacturing, is they literally just perfect something and they just keep making small variants on it right. and they can charge so little because they, they finished paying for the R&D long, long ago. Sure, sure. But um, on the consumer side of things... There, there is nowhere that they can go buy that watch for even close to what we sold it for. Well, what I love is that you are, you're like a gateway drug to watches. Yeah, we just hand out little bags of watch crack, and we get them to, you know, come back every every month be and buy be more. Because you know, when you're mentioning that you're talking about like a solar powered chronograph, I'm like, that's not news to me. But then I realize. At one point in my life, that was news. Right. At one point, I was like, oh, the solar-powered watches? Oh, and there's a chronograph exactly. version. And I got excited about it. And I remember the first solar-powered chronograph I bought. This was in the early 2000s. I bought it on eBay. It was probably around that price. And I was really excited about it. I remember the first analog watch I ever bought was a Citizen. And this was, was when not all citizens were EcoDrive. And so it wasn't until a few years later that I got a Citizen Eco Drive, and I was so excited. I was like, "Oh, it's going to be light yeah. powered," and you get so excited about it, and then you wear it, and then no one, no one else cares, right. and then you feel lonely. <laughs> and I had like a solid, like almost decade of feeling so lonely as a watch lover. And your and your audience is lucky because they were able to skip all that because now with the communities online, especially Watch Gang, and of course a blog to watch, blog to watch is you know I think a little bit more intimidating for someone who's a novice, especially when it comes to commenting. Right. But you, you create this very welcoming environment for guys that don't need to feel bad about not knowing about the latest exactly. this or the history of that. Yeah, because I think that what, they, what they're used to is they're used to going into larger communities or forums and asking what might seem like dumb questions. But really, like you just said, we all started somewhere. We, and and it's, it's, you know, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be something to judge someone on because they're just now getting into watches. So when they ask questions and they're looking for advice or, or for knowledge, um, yeah, our community welcomes that because we are basically a young uh, company with a community of, of people that are just getting into that. And we see people starting with our low tier and then graduating throughout our membership levels as they learn more. They want better watches and, uh, and better deals. Would you say that there's enough maturity in your community such that they have an opinion on the watch industry? Sure. There, there's, a, there's a percentage of our community that would. What do they feel about today's watch industry? Uh, well, I think that, um, yeah, if we took the pulse of those that, that 
are a bit more knowledgeable about the watch community uh, or watch industry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's changing a lot. I think that, I think it's changing faster than the watch companies are willing to change with it, right? And, and what I'm seeing right now is that there are, you know, 100-year-old brands that are willing to change the way that they sell to customers by working with us, which tells me that we are sort of on the edge of, of that change. And, you know, the watch companies that are willing, um, they kind of tag along with that. What about you? What do you now that you're, you know, I guess almost two years into this, what do you feel about this industry? And what were some maybe like preconceptions you had going into it that you've since uh, been able to resolve and find out maybe you were right or maybe you were wrong? Well, I had no idea about the markups in the watch industry. I didn't know how many people stand in the middle between the manufacturer and the, and the customer, right? And so- Oh, like all the middlemen? Yeah, the distributors and then, and then the wholesalers and then the retailers, right? And so essentially what Watch Gang has done, and you've probably seen this on a million watch Kickstarters, they're like, oh yeah, we cut out all the middlemen and we get you this great deal. Well. You know, even even those, a lot of those Kickstarters, they're still charging four times what what it costs them to manufacture. So we get great deals by buying you know so many watches and by providing a marketing benefit to the to the watch. Brand. I feel like I want to have more visuals on the screen of the watches and the community, like on your on your website, our Facebook page. Your Facebook page, yeah, our group. Are you uh, mem- you're probably not a member. I'm not a member of your group. Yeah, it's, it's all members so, it's, only. so the interesting thing is, you go to the watching website. And the first time I went, I think it was a slightly different design. Uh-huh. And I like wasn't really sure what you did, and I had no idea what the watches were. Um, you have to kind of like be, I guess, a member to really see most of the activity and the tools and all the stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you have this wheel that uh-huh. you were excited about. Yep. I, I love this thing because it's. And I think this is one of the good things about having someone who is is not a call it a watch industry like. Um, veteran. Mm-hmm. No one in the watch industry would ever think to do something like that. Not because they don't understand the concept, but they're like, does that devalue the watch? Right. And you coming in with a slightly more fresh perspective, you recognize it's not just about the product. It's also about the consumer experience. Yes. And that's what's been missing for a lot is yeah. the consumer experience. I agree. I think that, you know, um, most most watch brands, they want the experience to feel like you know what it feels like to walk into a Macy's or a Nordstrom or any jewelry store you know and I think that there, there's obviously a market for that but that's not who we tend to cater to right we we're sort of a young audience and a fun company and we're we're letting people discover watches you know 200 year old industry um, in a new way and I think that seems really exciting to a lot of these guys I think the industry is even older than that wristwatches oh yeah oh wristwatches yeah wristwatches well it's difficult to sort of say just wristwatches because, you know, these companies were making clocks and pocket watches that were very similar and still making sure. pocket watches after they started making wristwatches. What do you think about doing like a grandfather clock wristwatch? Has that been done? Should we do that? Um, you're going to have to explain that a little bit more to me. Well, imagine a grandfather clock, but it's on your wrist. I'm thinking there's a dimension problem here. No, 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 no. I mean, it's like you don't like the shape, like yeah. this long yeah, column yeah. Oh, yeah, style totally. thing. Yep. Um, you know, you redesign it a bit, but it still has the... Uh, is it wood? Yeah, it's wood. And it has the pendulum. Mm-hmm. I don't know how this would work from the perspective of physics. Well, you just have to walk around with your with your wrist at 90 degrees. That way... It Wouldn't always... it make more sense to have a small grandfather clock that you wear around your neck? Well, then you're just... Uh, then it hangs there? Then you're mixed between, like, 2 chains and a Flava Flav. You know what's that? I don't even know who 2 chains is, but I'm... Do you know just... Flava Flav? Yes, I do. I interviewed him a few times. Did you? Yes. Was he wearing like a big Movado clock on his neck? <laughs> you know, the first... The first... You know, you know how he, Flavor Flav start, started wearing the clock? Yeah. You know what the story is? No. Um, he told this to me. And he said that it was a dare. His, his, some of his crew friends um, were into stealing stuff. And they... And they stole stuff from a home goods store and one of the things they stole was a clock and then they dared him to wear the stolen clock around his neck on on stage it was a shower clock and he wore it on stage during performance out of a dare and he's a trendsetter and it just sort of became a thing and what's interesting and i always love i would love to visit this room but he says it is his mom's house there's a room that has all these clocks that people sent him over the years all these clocks why did, can we back up for a sec? Why did why did you interview Flavor Flav? 
Why did I interview Flavor Flav? I don't remember who I was interviewing it for. Maybe it was for the Hollywood Reporter, but I had already known him. Yeah. Because I met him in Vegas. He's a very sweet guy. The one thing I remember about the actual interview I did for that was during the interview, he decided it'd be a good idea to go to the drive-thru at Wendy's. Sounds like <laughs> something he would do. <laughs> did he get a junior bacon cheeseburger? I, I, could, I don't remember what it is he ordered. Okay. Um, but the first time I saw him, he was actually wearing... Um, he was wearing like he may have been wearing a watch on each wrist, but he was definitely wearing a, a, a big Invicta. Okay. Which was which was funny, and All it was right. it was actually at um, a watch brand event, and he was there not for the watch brand, but for the other people there, because it was a it was actually a boxing event, so he he had a lot of friends there hmm. in that world. I remember um, watching his dating show. That's how I really. Uh... That's how I got like Date. got to know Flavor Flav. I didn't even remember that until yeah, now. He remember? had a and then, and then there was a spinoff called I Love New York because the one of the girls on the show, New York, was her nickname. I think her and Flavor Flav like fell in love on the show, but she was such a dynamic character that she got her own spinoff. You he, should you find know, her and interview her. Flavor Flav is a very simple guy. You know, he a lot of these guys they're they're humble and that's how they're able to create compelling art and then when they get involved with fame and money and responsibility they find it very challenging and it's it's interesting because if you look at a lot of um the colleagues from from that era of music he actually came out pretty okay yeah you know what i mean there's no major scandals he got a reality show how many of the guys got that true and i'm not saying he's necessarily perceived as a pillar of the community but he's not he's not really controversial except he wears Stolen clocks. Well, he someone you know. Look, <laughs> at the time, that was a cool thing to do. I mean, he was part of this rebellious community of like screw the man music, and I've actually been interested on how that era of music helped define watch tastes for today's sort of urban music market. You know, because it's interesting. People tend to think of that time they were all wearing Rolexes for the most part. But the question is, why were they wearing Rolexes, and why aren't they wearing Rolexes now? Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. I think it's because of uh, the fake watch busta on Instagram. What what uh, what has that guy done to the? Uh... I mean, he's he's just wrecking the the rap community. Does he still do that? Uh, yeah, I think so. I interviewed that guy a while ago. Did you? Yeah, we had I, a whole The reason about I know it. about that guy is because when we started and I was giving away Rolexes um, at, for our community. Um, you know, people are quick to yell scam and fake and things like that, and so people kept tagging him on our Instagram posts. Why? Because they they're trolls. They want to they want to you know trolls on the internet. Can you believe it? No. Yeah, I mean it's a new thing, but yeah. So they, what did what did the fake watch buster say to you guys? Nothing. He doesn't care about us. He's never he's never posted on our stuff. I well, I'm hoping it's because our stuff's all real and he doesn't care. But you know, obviously it's. Uh, I don't know that he, we never garnered or you know his attention. Does that mean you're you're not the fake watchbuster? Uh, who? What a what a circle that would be. Uh, no, I'm I'm not the fake watchbuster. Is he? A, is is his identity a mystery? I think. I mean, I I, I like I said, I communicate like, with him. I know it's not you. Okay, I was gonna say, is he like the? But he, uh, he has like colleagues like now. Uh, does he? Yeah. Well, Banksy is like an operation. That's not one person. Really. I think fake watchbuster is just one, one guy. Hmm. Okay. One guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna take your. I didn't your even word. realize that was still a thing, but I actually love that there was this this sort of like citizens' rebellion. It's like it it's kind of like one of those guys. You know those like anti-corruption bloggers in third world countries that get yeah. you know thrown in jail, unfortunately. Yep. That is that is related to social justice. Fake watchbuster and guys like that is interesting to me because it's it's the same type of mentality. But for a demographic that isn't what I call a high-risk uh, group. Totally. I think that he's – so <laughs> what he's doing is uh, he's just keeping people honest, right? Like these, these guys that wear fake Rolexes and they make music videos with rented Ferraris and fake Rolexes and stuff. Like they – you know, they uh, – they're trying to portray an image that this guy is like, no, I'm going to call bullshit But on the that. funny thing is, is that the primary demographic that purchases those cars and watches probably knows that that's all crap anyways. And it's, it's like, so he's, he's, what I yeah, think but is, they, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't create that to advertise to those people. They do it for the people that they want to aspire to become right. a Rolex. So what owner. I like about it, there's a sort of sense of social justice related to aspirational people. Mm -hmm. 
and it's saying don't look up to the wealth that you think these people have because like you said it's rented or artificial right and i think there's actually value in that actually a lot more than people talk about because the internet is basically a deception economy people get away with what they can and since there's basically no law enforcement online it's the wild west it's self-policing now it kind of is right. so you have someone like that love them or hate them that at least attempts to capture back a little bit of authenticity or which i think is actually more effective shames liars there isn't enough liar shaming going on on the internet wouldn't you agree i would agree well you know okay yes i agree but in certain circles there are you know i mean it's i think it's i think it's growing i think i think the demand for authenticity and and for calling out liars and i mean if you're on reddit there are a ton of subreddits that are just dedicated to calling people out and oh really yeah like there are, there are do you know reddit yeah sure okay so there are subreddits where you know I'm not familiar I, with every subreddit. I'm one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> there's quite that a would bit be of impressive. That. Yeah, the, there's one like called "I Am Very Smart," where they just take screenshots and show people that are, you know, they just make comments that are ridiculous for the sake of trying to show how smart they are. And then there, there are ones that um, "Quit Your Bullshit" is another one where they people get called out and then they make. You so know, you're into uh, this thing. I love it. Yeah. You're into. I I mean it's it, that's super entertaining to me to watch somebody portray themselves as one thing and then get called out and then not only that but it gets put on the internet for other people to see okay are you doing this because you like calling people out or you're trying to see the things that can be most easily called out no i like i like feeling a little uh like i like to, to feel uncomfortable in movies and in watching those images like i i like to cringe a little because i think that that's a very like real reaction to something so when you watch i don't know like a movie for instance that have you seen get out right? i have I, I need to i haven't so seen i that. saw this movie get out and you know it was super uncomfortable and i'm in the theater like squirming in my seat a little watching and it doesn't sound like a great experience but that's like that's a very different reaction than you get in a lot of things and, and i'd rather have you know, a very strong reaction that way than just kind of be whatever with it. I love comfort. You, <laughs> you love to be comfortable. I'm a comfort seeker. Okay. I want, I want everything to be happy and real. But I, look, lying makes me uncomfortable. Lying makes look, you uncomfortable. Most of the internet makes me uncomfortable because I don't trust it. Like, before everyone started talking about fake news, I'm like, and this is news to anyone? That there's, right. like, a bunch of fake stuff on the internet? No one's policing any of this stuff. You know, I try to explain to people, our entire society is based upon the fact that there are rules that you follow, and if you don't, you get punished. Okay? People try to say, like, oh, no, people have inherent morals. Yeah, there's a lot of that. But what happens in places where there's no laws? People commit crimes, or what you would call a crime. When you have a punishment or a disincentive to that, that, that conduct, people tend to not do it. So online, there's almost no disincentive, plus you get to be anonymous, at least mostly anonymous. True. So if you have a place where there aren't really any enforcement of rules, and it's very easy to not get caught, that's a perfect playground for people to do a bunch of mischief and get away with whatever they can get away with. And you know, taking this back to the watch space, as someone who's a new consumer into watches, just trying to figure stuff out, I would liken it to, to walking through a minefield. You can, you can have your money taken away from you in so many bad ways, way more than good ways. There's a hundred watches that will be a waste of your money for any, every one watch that is not a waste of your money. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about it. What makes a watch a waste of your money? Low value proposition. Meaning resale value? Um, some people would co consider it that. For me, as, as someone that doesn't, I don't plan on selling watches when I get it. And some people do. Right. Someone's like, I'm going to have this for a year. I want to know what I can get for it. And that's right. legitimate. Right. For me, I get like married to them. What I want to make sure of is that there's enough inherent value to justify the purchase price. Sure. And I measure inherent value as a function of design quality, material quality, construction quality, rarity, uh, innovation. Uh, overall aesthetics it's a number of factors i mean we don't need to go into what they are but it's like you know oftentimes when you are paying too much for something it's part of my personality it's just part of who i am not everyone's the same way like i feel very uncomfortable paying more or or in other words getting a poor value it makes me feel like i'm not being responsible enough to the the resources i've worked so hard to acquire 
Isn't value just a perception, though? Probably. I mean, obviously, that there there are components that let's just take it to watches. There are components in a watch that demand a certain value, right? And that's because you can't make it or you can't buy it for that price, right? And that that makes it valuable. I look at it as a function of, I'll just call it hours invested. Okay. Like, let's take two paintings. Okay, we'll take one that someone spent, I'll just use 100 hours painting, Mm -hmm. and one where they just sort of splashed some paint on there and they spent one hour. Okay. So if you measure that as a function of the amount of time they put in it, yes, there's other things like scale and talent and da-da-da-da-da, they can go, that 100 hours could be 100 hours of shitty work or one hour of amazing work. Exactly. Yeah, that's a a factor. Exactly. But let's just say those artists are equal. Okay. Okay, equal talent, equal skill. Which one of those is going to be worth more? The 100 hour one or the one hour one? The one you like more. Really? Yeah. Well, what if, what, because taste is, in my opinion, subjective. It is. You have to figure out those things which you can objectively quantify, such as number of hours, such yeah, as but that's the not quality of the metal. Art, art, if we're talking about art, isn't that, I don't think the number of hours that goes into that has, I don't think anybody that buys a painting thinks about how, how much time went into creating it, and that's why they buy it. But you're talking to someone that does. So you, you buy art based on how long it took them to paint? I buy art based upon a combination of skill and talent. And oftentimes okay. skill means doing something well. And, and when, you, when it comes to doing something well by hand, it often requires time to get the details right. Mm-hmm. You know, We've all purchased things, watches or otherwise, that feel like the design was rushed. Sure. OK? And we're like, boy, this would have been a lot better if only they put more time into it. Okay. And I think it's actually kind of ironically you know, relevant that we're talking about the value of a timepiece being related to the amount of time that goes into it. It's something that people can, it, it's, a, it's a feel good statement, which is actually real. You know, I'm looking at some of the watches here in, in my office and there's just a random assortment. And I know certain watches that simply took more time. For example, a case, it's the amount of steps. A three-step case, meaning there's three steps to make it, requires a lot less time than a, than a case that requires 50 steps. Now, three steps is a little bit of a, uh, it, it's a little low, but there's watches, that, there's, there's cases that, that are made of dozens of parts, sometimes even more. Each of those parts had to be machined, polished, quality control. All of that, to me, equates to time. I'm not even talking about material cost. I'm talking about time and effort. And I, as a consumer, respond very well to getting things that have a high degree of time and effort. If only because you and I, that may have totally different tastes, can objectively agree that this amount of time is more valuable than this less amount of time. But that only matters if people are willing to buy it. Would you rather, would you rather wear an ugly watch with 12 pieces in the case or with a nice one that you like with three? Well, I think that's a very good point. But at the end of the day, I would rather wear a nice watch that I like, meaning a, a quality watch that uh-huh. I like, and I have found plenty of cheap watches that look nice, but the 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 handling and the cheapness will prevent me from wearing it. So sure. I need I need both of those you things can, to be there. Right. Okay. Now, what about the people that can't get both of those things? Because adding both of those things, I think you'd agree, means a higher cost, right? Well, you got to hunt. Okay. I think that the amount of deals out there, the amount of used watches out there means that I don't care what your budget is, somewhere at any given time in the world is a watch that you will love that's a price that you can afford. Okay. I, I, I want to believe you. Look, this comes from someone that when I started being a watch lover, when I was sort of in the mode that a lot of the watch game customers were, I would troll eBay for hundreds of hours a month. Okay. Okay, just like meticulously going through. It was almost this weird thing where like I had this list of brands. I literally had a list, brands and models, and every couple of days I would just be typing through. Are there any new these, any new these, any new these? Most of these things, there was never any result ever because it was such a rare, obscure watch. And at the time, there just wasn't as much watch activity on eBay. And once in a while, I'd find one at a price that I can afford. I'd be like, boom. For every, like, literally, like, 5,000 watches, maybe I'd buy one that I looked at. You ever get one from eBay that was broken or fake? Yes. And I returned it, and eBay gave me my money back, and it was a very pleasant experience. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. When I started Watch King, I I got my Rolexes from there, uh, the ones to give away. And I think two or three of them 
ended up being either Frankenstein watches, which means fake and some, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> some some parts are not authentic or real or original. Um, one of them just literally had uh, like a fake bracelet. The the hands were fake. I mean, it was. It was I would awful. go on eBay right now, but there's really no more fake watches on there. Is that true? On eBay? Yeah. I mean, they don't. They're not advertised as fake. They're hard to find. No, but I mean, so out of these watches, three three that I got, I probably paid four thousand dollars for each. But a one. franken a franken watch is very different than than a flat out replica. Well, okay. So if you take the the head of a let's say a franken watch, and it has a few parts in it that are not original, but then it comes with a fake bracelet like a fake oyster um bracelet or like the pre like one of them had the president bracelet where which is supposed to be all white gold right uh and it was just i mean it was stainless steel and they didn't they never made that in stainless steel i think it's it's the way that it comes to a consumer a fake watch is produced specifically to be uh, a copy of an existing real product uh -huh. um of course, it doesn't always use the same materials. It doesn't always look perfect. Of course, the quality is way off. But it's made by a factory and sold as a fake watch. Right. The Franken watches are like, it was once a real watch. Uh huh. Then somebody bought it and modified it. Maybe someone else did further modification. There's so many degrees of separation between the original person making it yep. and that end consumer that bought it that it's like, that product didn't originate as a as as a as a Franken watch. Right. It turned into that. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. What is what do you think about obviously there are homage pieces, right? But I've seen some that are literally they would be replicas if the logo was just different, right? So homage you mean it looks like something but sure. they don't go so far as to violate the, the trademark. Exactly. I've struggled with this question. Um, I think homage watches have a really important purpose because they keep the luxury brands on their toes to producing things that are actually hard to make. Um, there are some brands out there that people know that come out with a product and charge a certain amount of money for it. And you and I looked at each other and were like, is it really worth that? Like, I get that they have some people spending it, but does it really cost them that? Meaning, can you then come in and undercut it and offer a substantially similar product. I right. think people are intellectually interested in this notion. Rolex, for example, I've never seen a fake Rolex that is able to match what I know you're supposed to look for in a real Rolex. Right. Visually, okay, it's, it can be very, very close. But that tactile experience of feeling the bracelet, feeling the machining of the metal, I've never seen a fake watch that's come anywhere close. Yeah. Now, Rolex is a difficult watch to um, fake because the tolerances are tiny and things like that. And it's just, it's hard to do and most of them don't get it very well. There's other watches that don't have a bracelet that come on a strap that, that you know, are, or are even more simple dials. They're a lot easier to fake or homage. So what I like about the homage is that it, it, it communicates to the community that Whatever the brand wants to charge for this product, I was able to come up with this amount of quality for this price. And it kind of puts the brand on notice that they need to go and reestablish their value proposition. Like, hey, our stuff isn't actually exclusive anymore. I believe that when you buy a luxury product, you need to be buying something that is either hard to do or that others can't do. It goes back into the whole time thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, while I'm not necessarily someone that would wear homage watches, I respect that sometimes you want to go for a look and you want to experiment on what does that look like, as well as this notion of keeping the real luxury brands a little bit on their toes, which frankly they need to be. That's a pretty interesting way to look at it. I've never considered that it helps keep luxury brands fresh. Well, it's an look, interesting look at the car, the car industry. Sure. The luxury brands come out with technology that's exclusive to them, eventually like Kia's got it, and they're like, oh, now we need to wow consumers with something else. Imagine how slowly the car industry would have de developed. If you look at the car industry's development versus the watch industry development in, in modern times, it's no comparison. The car industry has gone 1,000 miles ahead where the watch industry has just kind of been poking along. Uh -huh. But there was a time in the 20th century that the watch industry was going probably maybe even a little bit faster than the car industry, or at least as fast, because it was still a necessary product that had a, had a a competitive element uh, because it was, a, it was a utility product. In watches, 
there's always this confusion about luxury is timeless. No, I don't give a shit if you think your design is timeless. Your product needs to be with the times. If you want someone to spend new watch money on a new watch, and you want, to, and you want them to, to understand that this is a worth $8,000, you need to give them $8,000 worth of watch. Because if you're not, you, all you're selling you them is a brand. How do you give somebody $8,000 worth of watch when it costs $800 to make it? The mentality should always be, in my opinion, that you are selling a product and not a brand. Okay. And these days, too many companies are trying to sell a brand. Yeah. And they're like, if we, if we boost up the brand enough, people will want to spend this amount because we're such a sexy brand. That's, but that's true. Is it though in America? I mean, how many people do you know? Well, maybe you're not the right person to ask this, but I mean, Michael Kors sells a ton of watches in America. But not at $6,000. No, but at, at $300, where I would argue they can get a much better watch for $300. Okay. Right, and they the, only do that because of the brand. There's, I would say it's more about the design. Okay. I think that Michael Kors was able to do something that was, that, that they actually kind of took off. So Michael Kors were all produced by Fossil. Fossil. Group, yeah. Fossil handled the design, everything. It was a great success for them. I think they did a fantastic job. But Fossil admittedly takes things that worked in the luxury space and they work it into a, uh, they call it the fashion market. Okay. So what they did is they took a, te they did, they took a technique that worked very well at the exact same time by Chanel. And what Chanel did is they took a classic looking sports watch and dressed it up in a fashionable way in black or white ceramics, so the J12. If you look at the basic J12, it's just a, looks like a 1960s dive watch with a slightly tweaked dial for Chanel, a little bit modern. But of course, it being in ceramic and shiny and things like that, that's, that's, all, that's all a new element. And so if you look at the, the, most of these core Michael Kors design watches, they're very simple, arguably vintage style designs, but with colors, materials, and other aesthetic elements that act as a skin on top of that design. So it's taking something timeless, but making it more fun and playful, and a little bit more interesting with materials that may have never existed or would never been used back then. And that's the formula I think they're going with. Okay, I can, I mean, I, I can get behind that, but I think, it, I think that this, uh, the exact same watches could be created by an unknown brand and they'd have a really hard time selling. Brand, look, I'm not saying that brand doesn't have value. It right. surely does. But in the watch space, there's been an overemphasis on brand value okay. as opposed and an underemphasis on product value. In America, I believe, and maybe some will prove me wrong, but compared to other countries, especially places like Asia, where a lot of the luxury watch brands put enormous amount of their effort, in Asia, my understanding is that brand is what sells. People want to be associated with the image of a brand. And then within that brand, they choose a product that they want. Mercedes figured this out a long time ago. Mercedes figured out that a lot of people want a Mercedes car. Now let's just create a car for their demographic. Not even the kind of car they want to drive or need, but one that they feel like price point, design, features, it had nothing to do with like we're trying to build the best car. Right. It was like, let's build a car for this demographic who we've already sold on the Mercedes brand. I heard someone from Mercedes one time say, like, you know, once someone gets into the showroom, like, they already know that people want the Mercedes brand. They go in there. So it's just like pushing them the right car. They don't need to sell the brand on them. They already know that they want the brand. It's just sort of funneling them to the right vehicle. Yeah, that's why the C Class exists. It's the Mercedes Corolla. Yeah, exactly. And it feels like one. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very happy with Mercedes right now, that's all. Uh, we know you have a very interesting story, there, but they were good to you. They actually, you know what? I gotta be honest. They they were good to me. They bought it back. I had I had a I had a, a car that the the transmission went out, and then I kept having transmission problems. This was with a you know an AMG engine. And then you and, learned it didn't even have a transmission. Yeah right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's moving the gears? Yeah. So they yeah they bought it back actually two days ago. Are you gonna get another Mercedes? No. <laughs> no, no, no. They didn't try to keep you in the brand? Well, it's interesting. So I don't know if this is a, I don't know if this is just the way that the car industry works, but they, they work with a company who deals with buying the car back for them and then sells it back to Mercedes for the same price they bought it for. And I think that's to avoid lemon laws. So they, they can take the car back and then just resell it after they fix whatever is wrong without having it appear as a, as a lemon return. 
It's oh. very interesting. So the guy who met me at the dealership did not work for Mercedes. He worked for a different company. Issued me the check from that company, but then they end up buying it and then just giving it to Mercedes for the same price. Did you feel that Mercedes were doing it because they wanted to, or they felt like they had to? No, I was I was a huge pain in their ass. After after I was having continual like transmission problems after they replaced the transmission, you know, I'm leasing a new car, and three months later I need a new transmission. I'm without the car, still paying the crazy lease price for it, and then yeah, I still have problems. So I I was taking it in every week, and I'm like, look. You know, you need to buy this back from me, or I'm going to make this a lemon problem for you guys. And I think that, you know, so I want to say yes, they did right by me, but I kind of pushed them to do that. So here's the interesting thing. Let's let's sort of bring this back to the watch industry okay. for a moment. This situation occurs not infrequently when someone buys a brand new luxury watch, which is supposed to have a amazing experience with it, uh -huh. and it has its equivalent of lemon problems. Um, but unlike these laws that protect you as a consumer when you buy a car, mm -hmm. nothing like this exists. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are consumer protection laws, but there's nothing specific about this. And they see people who buy expensive watches as being a not particularly vulnerable status of individuals. Uh, I, I think it's more to do with the amount of money that's being spent. So you take somebody that they, they can afford one car and it's a huge part of their monthly payments of you know of their salary, and so the I think the protections exist to, you know, because you have to have a car. You don't have to have a watch. What? And, and the watch doesn't have to be worth thirty thousand dollars. Doesn't? Come on. <laughs> I mean, if there was a watch consumer protection agency, I mean, that sounds silly, doesn't it? I think you need to have that as a new arm for watch. <laughs> I mean. That could totally exist. And then you will fight for them. So anytime someone buys a watch your advocate, yeah. and there's a problem, uh -huh. you will go into that store, you will go into that brand, you will pound your fist on the table, scream lemon. <laughs> they won't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> this watch is a lemon! That's right. A demand of return. Look, I've heard a lot of stories, more than I want to admit, of people who bought a brand new watch and it just keeps having problems. And here's a weird thing. The brands, even though they take it back sometimes and work on it, one it never admit it has a ha, admits that it has a problem. Right. Two, um, usually does not make good by the consumer. Usually it's just like that's the watch you bought, and it leads to this other thing where there's a lot of high end watches out there, unlike cars, that don't work from day one. Now this is less of an issue today than it was about five or six years ago. What changed to make that the case? Um, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, it used to be this notion that if you sold someone like a $200,000 exotic watch that didn't work, um, either they didn't wear it enough to realize it, or you would handle it privately through them. Now, the brands realize that when people are disgruntled, where do they go? They go on the internet. Yep. And they complain a lot like crazy. So brands started saying, oh, wait a minute, we can't keep, this is going to be a scandal for us. If, like... I mean, there were brands that I would go into stores, for example. I remember one time I was in, when I was still living in San Francisco, I went to Neiman Marcus. And this was when Neiman Marcus still had like a, a hand watch section. And the, the salesperson there told me that there were certain brands, not just models, but certain brands, that every single one of the watches sold would come back. Wow. Every single one. Why? Because they were producing defective movements. Why would they keep selling them? That's a good question. <laughs> But like that, the, that, that the was Bayer, happening. The Bayer of the watch industry. The Bayer, like yeah. the pharmaceutical company? Yeah. And what, what they did in the 80s when they sold all the AIDS drugs to Africa? I think it was the, like... Was there AIDS drugs in, in well, the 80s? Well, no, they were, I think they, they were, uh, what's, the, what's the blood disease that when you don't make enough platelets or iron or something? Oh. Um, wow. <laughs> you don't... You don't make enough platelets or iron. I can't remember what 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 it's called. It's a blood disease. Anyway, the Bayer had a had a. It's not when you're anemic. It. Yeah, anemia. Yeah. So um, I thought this is not having enough blood as it is. Or I guess that's not okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I think Bayer in the '80s had a drug to for that, and then it was contaminated with HIV, and then they, you know, they, the U.S. was like, okay, obviously you can't sell that here. And they're like, okay, we'll just sell it in Africa. And they did it. And they infected a bunch of people with HIV. Anyway, that's the, that's the Bayer version of the watch industry. Not quite. 
Um, <laughs> the, the thing, the reason I'm kind of have this stupid smile on my face, I'm like, that sounds like a lot of things I know the watch industry has done. <laughs> they uh, routinely take things that they can't sell in one market, like where push can they it sell in market? I mean, let's look at the gray market. At least it doesn't kill people. Gray market is a great example. Oh, the gray market. That's, oh. They, you know, the brand, like, let's say you're a retailer, I'm the brand, yeah. okay? I sell you a product, and, and one of the reasons you buy the product for me is you, is you, is you believe that you can sell it at the retail price that I set. Right. And I'm like, I'm going to support you. You're such a great store. We love you guys. Your store is beautiful. <laughs> don't discount, please. Don't discount. Please don't discount. This is discount, like, we have to sever our relationship with you. Is this a European South Park character? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> and then, like, at the end of the year, that brand will be like, uh-oh. We have another 10,000 watches we can't get rid of. Yep. And so the first thing I do is I call you. I'm like, hey. Yep. And I'm like, hey, I still have some left. I can't sell them. And like, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. You sure? <laughs> I'm sure. Good deal. All right, now call me. I'm Joe Mashop. Now call me. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's what they would do. They'd yeah. be like, don't tell me what I asked Yeah, you, don't tell anyone. Let's make it a cash deal. Could you please buy $10,000, 10,000 watches yep. at, you know, 40 cents on the dollar? Exactly. No, 35, 30. Okay. Okay. So that you as a retailer that invested in that, in that brand... And by investing, you literally bought those watches. Yep. You spent a lot of money on that inventory. And that money that they took from you with that pre-order, because you're, you're paying well in advance, mm -hmm. they were going out to manufacture. So it really is an investment. You're almost investing in a production run. Yeah. You now then can't sell those watches at that price you thought you could because the gray market is flooded with the exact same product yep. that your money originally helped pay to produce. Yep. And the only difference being the, the warranty. Right, the gray market can't offer you the manufacturer's warranty. Also, the ma the the, ma the manufacturer has this nice message somewhere on their website that says, "Please don't buy watches online, mm -hmm. or please don't buy watches from unauthorized dealers. They could be fake. Yeah, they could be counterfeit. We can't guarantee their authenticity." <laughs> yeah, I, I I remember it was Breitling. It was they they finally stopped doing this, and I actually told them like, "You would go to Breitling's website as a consumer. Like, imagine one of the watch game guys, okay." They're just getting into nicer stuff. They want to learn about it. They go to the Breitling website. I want to learn about this. The first thing that you see is this pop-up with this like scary-ass message of like, never look at watches online. If you buy any, it's probably fake. It was like this really scary message. It was, it was, and it was a pop-up. And I'm like, that's the feeling that I want to get before I go peruse their models is this like scary warning. Yeah. Like, did anybody realize that's not exactly great for like consumer morale? How would well, you feel? Well, I mean, I think this sort of circles back to what we talked about in the beginning, where the watch companies are not willing to evolve with the consumers. We buy things online. That's just the way it is. They've you can't been around for a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. Well, the internet's been around for thirty years. Like you can't, they can't operate the way they did in the early nineteen hundreds, you know. And they still try. They try to ignore the internet. Yeah. I mean, look, we try to ignore the internet. The internet's not going anywhere. Nope. I love the argument that they still make, and I remember something like, like, but Ariel, do you really think people are buying an expensive thing online? This is for <laughs> underwear and toilet paper, isn't it? <laughs> Come and I'm on. Like, I'm How like, do they even think that in, in because this year? It, because America, it's not the only market, but compared to Switzerland, it's much more progressive in our comfort level of buying things online. Remember, Swiss people are not big on the whole trusting thing. Okay. If they don't like see the product, they're like, they're like, this is a fly-by-night operation. You mean I have to pay you before you send it to me? How dare you? Wow. Now they're obviously much more I mean, people literally them. buy their car online now. Tesla takes pre-orders, and you can build a car and buy it without even seeing it in person. And then you go pick it up. I mean... It should that, be that way with watches. Of course it should be that way They don't want to build it until you pay for it? Do it that way. Right. I mean, look, you know, somebody was asking me, they were interviewing me. I do a lot. I, I, I spend plenty of time giving free advice to students that uh, are writing papers. Like apparently, there's this there's these people in Switzerland that are getting degrees. Actually, it's not just Switzerland. It's other various parts of Europe, France and Germany as well. It's mostly in Switzerland. They they get degrees in like watch brand management. Like there's degrees in this. I mean, it's not surprising, right? But then they do these projects, and they always seem to come to me for ask questions. And, and the questions are very often the same, and you know, they're over there trying to like put together like, you know, clever papers on how to deal with the gray market and the problems of overproduction and blah, blah, blah. And one of the common questions that, that I get a lot is, you know, r related to how do you get around um, not wanting to produce less watches? Because too many watches are produced. 
is there a way around that of still producing the same amount of watches? And they're like, what if you make a bunch of personalized watches? And I'm like, you can't mass produce that. The whole point right. of a personalized watch is that you selected something for you that no one else has. Right. If a bunch of other people have the exact same thing, A, it's not particularly personal, and B, it doesn't get around the problem because people are trying to buy exclusivity. If you take away the exclusivity from an exclusive product, you can't do anything. Yeah. So I don't even know what they're teaching in these schools. I mean, it's kind of like, I, I don't know. I mean, I think to a point, people would want a personalized watch, but um, I don't know, it kills the resale value. Right, and then oh, yeah. unless you're gonna keep it forever, why would you want that? And, you mean and you yeah, don't want to buy a watch that says Ariel Adams on it, all over it? I would. Okay. That's me though. That's sweet. I it? yeah, but just one, and I'm just one person, so it's still not mass produced, is it? I mean, that's the problem, right? You can't mass produce those, and I mean, if they if they want to make the same amount of watches, and then, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know. So here's the question: Five years from now, uh -huh. what kind of watches? do you want, ideally, to be shipping to the watch game customers? I would love it if we became a platform for pre-releasing watches from brands that they used us as a marketing tool and, and a tool for- How would that work? Well, it's, it's both a marketing tool and it's a tool for uh, gauging customer interest, right? So we, we sort of have this group of tastemakers and before they do this this run to see if the the you know the general public will want to buy something i mean we have a an amazing audience that can give them data that they can't get anywhere else you know it's not a facebook ad we're putting their watches on people's wrists and getting real time feedback so my my goal for this part this branch of our company would be to yeah to have uh micro and well established brands um send things exclusively to watch gang customers and how would, you, how would you get feedback delivered to the brand that would be useful for them to incorporate? Because I think one of the interesting things is that when you ask people for advice, especially on, on things related to something as detailed as a watch, I mean, I usually don't get them to say too much more than, I like it, I don't, it's too this, it's too that. Like, like I'm one of the unique people that can go down there and say, this line's wrong, this right. finishing is wrong, this is so hard to see. You, I mean... You're in the minority, though, right? Most most of these watch companies are not selling to a bunch of you. They right? should be. They should, but you know that that's just unfortunately not the case. And it's so difficult being me. The, <laughs> when I uh, when we send out surveys to our customers, we ask questions like, "How often will you wear this? Right? Uh, is this in rotation with your you know weekly watch uh, collection?" Are you, what are you going to do with this watch? Are you going to gift it or keep it? What did you like? What didn't you like? Did you like the value of the watch? You know, there are a lot of questions that are valuable for the brand to go so through and read that. you ask this now? Yes, we do. And people answer? Yeah, willingly. And we don't, you know, we don't What's incentivize that. What's some of the funniest that. stuff you've, you've seen people say? Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you would be surprised at how offended somebody could be at how much they didn't like a watch they got in a mystery watch club. You know, like they offended. literally offended. They're signing up for a club where they know they're getting a mystery timepiece and they are offended that they got something that they hated. And, uh, you know, I, I empathize with that and we, we do our best to make those, you know, situations better. But um, Do they yeah. offend you in the process? No, not anymore. I mean, there was one guy. <laughs> the one guy didn't offend me. It was literally the second month of business. And I remember I was in Mexico with my family. Um, my, my wife's family is, they all live in, in Mexico. And I woke up and I was checking my email uh, to read uh, feedback. And one guy, I will never forget this, um, he read the story about how Watch Gang started, which was my dad passing away and leaving me a watch. And he said he was glad my old man was dead. That motherfucker probably wore fake ass Rolexes. I hate you. I hate the watches you sent me. Die. And he signed off. He had died at the end? Yeah, his email. I mean, I remember the guy's name. It was Jay Woods. Like, I don't remember the email and, exactly. But, I mean, I won't forget it because that sat with me for a minute. And I was, I was wondering how, like, I was trying to assess how I feel. I'm laying there thinking. Did you felt, you felt, must have felt very alive at the moment. I did. I was a bit confused. I was wondering how awful his life is to, to say something like that to someone. And, you know, over a watch. And it made me really sad to think that there's somebody out there that's that 
upset or miserable with their life to, to say that. And, and they, you know, sort of, they're hanging their, their happiness based on the watch they got. I mean, anyway, that, that, that one stands out to me a lot. I mean, I think there's like, there's a lot to learn from this. First of all, that's awful. Like <laughs> that's a, that's a bad thing. Cause the thing is, you know, what, do you remember what tier he was at? This was, we only had the lower tier then. Okay. So, so he spent $30. He, he spent $30 on a watch on that a, ruined that he, his day. He could have returned. Of course. He could have returned. Yeah. Yet he went out of his way to make you feel like a bad person because he had a a minor aesthetic discomfort that morning. Yeah. I mean, that level of, of uh, you know, anger misdirection. It's weird. You know, like we, we are, we you and I in very different ways, but we are subject to anger misdirection. You know, Why? Got, well, okay. It's an interesting thing. So on a blog to watch, we have comments. We have mm -hmm. comments on the site, on YouTube, on, on social media. We have commentary. And, and of course, I can't look at everything, but I, I sort of try to get a gauge of the overall mood. And over the last couple of years, people have been depressed for a lot of reasons. Uh, the world economy and politics. There's a lot of instability. It makes people pissed off. People like stability and they like growth. When things are shrinking or unstable, it makes everyone very uncomfortable. So I think this is sort of global upsetness that happens and then people take it out on those closest to them mm -hmm. which includes their hobbies and their friends okay so watches is a hobby right so that we they, they and us they we share this together we both like watches but that's not enough camaraderie for them because these are the types of people that take anger out on those closest to them so what they'll do is they'll come and they'll read about a watch on a blog to watch and yes we're not selling them anything they didn't pay for anything but if there's a watch that doesn't represent their taste. They're like, how dare you post about a watch that I don't like? Did you know that I'm here reading about it? Did you know that I had to look at this? I'm so angry that this watch was even made. And I'm you just know, like, really? That's funny. I deal with a lot of the same type of people. And so I love my members. I love that we have this, this common interest. But in our, in our community, we have a lot of people that do bring that sort of anger about I and mean, they bring it for other people also like I'll give you an example last month let's say that I sent a watch from a partner and then this month I send the same watch from that partner but to different members that didn't get that watch people will be upset that I sent that watch out two months in a row even though no I, I guarantee you never get the same watch twice right so I'll send it to different people because it went over well and it was a popular watch, but they're like, how dare you repeat a watch? I want to see new watches every month. Like the membership is to get, it's for you to get a watch. It's not just, you don't get to tell other people what they can like and what they get, you know? And, and it's just misdirected and I end up banning a lot of people that way. Oh. I, don't, I don't like dealing with that toxic behavior. You know, it's not, it's not healthy. I was, and then, we'll, we'll, we'll finish the show on this topic. Because We're done I, already? We can do another one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this, this topic of banning, um, we've banned a very small number of people over the years. A very small number. Probably less than five. In, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, because I come from the standpoint of wanting to be as promoting a cooperative environment as possible. I think banning someone is not particularly cooperative. It's not like their behavior was cooperative. But I feel like, you know, like... Two, two, you know, negatives don't make a positive. Okay. Well, it does, but you know, two, you know, what? <laughs> two wrongs don't make a right. Let's okay. Take it, let's take it away from math. Let's All right. Bring it back to morals. Right. Okay. Two negative actions does not yield uh, a positive outcome. There's no justice there. Is it a negative action for somebody to, for somebody to be reprimanded? Is that is that negative? No one likes to be reprimanded because it makes them feel like they're children. And I've actually if had people... they act people like children. Say, oh, that's the thing. They don't know that they are. Okay. They just think they're having a good time on the internet. All right. Okay? They don't, they don't see the severity of what they're doing because they, again, are so accustomed to this notion of internet anonymity that if, if those people in the same room as us, we would be getting a totally different type of behavior. That's totally true. Right? Yeah. So, I, think, I, think it, I think the internet makes it very easy for people to... Yeah, they don't... I mean... This yeah. goes back to the lack of policing. Uh -huh. So you have to come to the internet with maturity. And you can be a sophisticated person with money and still lack a crap load of maturity. I've learned that the hard way. Okay? Yeah. I'm sure you have as well. My, so, 
My thing is that I've I've had I've tried to take that approach with it, and I've let people back in because we've had an adult conversation about their actions. And they do it and, again, and they always do it again. I swear to you, ninety nine percent of the time, they're always gone within a week again because they they can't help themselves. And so yeah. now it's a zero tolerance. When it happens and they're gone, that's it. We we at least attempt to make it very clear to them that we have rules, we have community guidelines. Uh -huh. I mean, for me, what I say is. Um, you have to foster a welcoming environment. Sure. And it really comes down. Then you have to treat people like you want to be treated. I agree with that. Um, and this notion of acting civil and fostering a welcoming environment for me is the best language. I mean, what, what is the exact language we have? Let's, let's find out. I forgot exactly. I mean, I wrote it. For your community? Guidelines? Yeah, yeah. I wrote a very simple statement that is above the comments. Here we go. Uh, be respectful. Statements which, pr which promote hostile or un uh, a, a hostile or unwelcoming environment are not accepted on blog to watch. And then we, we talk mm. more. But you it's know, just that simple. I have a very similar uh, uh, policy in my in my uh, community. It's just not as eloquently put. Mine says, uh, "Don't be a dick. Be excellent to each other." And that's it. And look, I have I have several paragraphs on it. <laughs> yes, you do. You know, but I but I the thing is, it felt uncomfortable. Even having to sit there and be like, you know, what are people not allowed to talk about? I mean, this is this is a pleasure. I entered this business as my career because I like watches. Yeah. You know, I didn't do this because I thought there was like a bunch of money in it. In fact, I've been the like, the least money chasing of all of the colleagues I know. That's because you have uh, journalistic integrity. I'm not even a journalist. Yeah, you kind of are. I took a few journalism classes. Okay. I'm a lawyer. Right. <laughs> all right. That's where that's where it comes yeah. from. Yeah. And. Also, I was just assuming that by the time you reached a place in life where you could appreciate and buy watches, you probably learned a bunch of things about how to get along with others. It's funny how wrong I was in that. Yeah, you're not right about that. How, I, that's, it's an amazing thing because in person, um, you know, we've both been to watch events. Everyone is nice and respectful. No one's getting into fist fights. It's extremely civilized. Yeah. Yet all of that seems to go away. And you know what's interesting? At these events, we've done not a huge amount of events over the years because they're, they're a lot of work and a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. to keep them good. But every single time we go to an in-person event, I have, I have yet to meet someone who's ever commented on the website. Hmm. So it's this entire different class of people from the commenters to the people that we meet. And also less no. than 1% of our audience comments. You, you probably have met plenty of commenters, but people act much differently in person. It's like, you know, I mean, oh, you it, think, oh, it's wow. the level of disconnection, right? So think about how you might encounter a person in an elevator who's, you know, they're like annoyed you're standing in their way. They're going to say, oh, excuse in me. In an elevator? Can I pass? Sure. But then if that same thing happens in the car, they're like, throw the fuck out of the way. They're beeping at you and a mother idiot. Right? You don't do that to somebody in an elevator because you're right next to them. So when you're in the car and you're yelling at someone, what's going through your mind? I don't do that. You sure? Well, eh. I mean, okay. I, the other day, uh, I was I was behind somebody who missed a green arrow, and then they also didn't start going when it turned green again. And I gave him a little a friendly beep, you know, the little hint, 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 And my daughter was in the back seat because I'm like, go, hint, hint, hitting the horn, and she's like, Daddy, uh, you should be more kind to people. And I'm like, Hun, he, he's not going. She's like, people want to do things when you're more kind to them. I'm like, how can I be kind? Your daughter is very wise. She is for a six-year-old, but how? What am I, I? How do I be more kind than that? I guess I could have just not said anything and gave him the little. You could tap, have tap. rammed the car. I agree. Just a gentle tap. A gentle tap. That'll get their attention. It certainly would. Yeah. And then I have to have an in-person conversation. I mean, you're already going to sell your car back to them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it wouldn't have been as easy with, with a fender bender, though. I mean, like, did you have those like? It's it's an SUV. It's got those big roll bars. Not the roll. The the, the, oh, yeah, the, the uh, grill and yep, all that. Yep. You remember in the 90s, it was really popular to have those, I don't even know what they're called. There was like these giant bars on the front of the car. Yeah, the grill like, protectors or something. It's like the big safari vehicles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wanted to ram each other. That's true. Those need to come back. I think they could come back. Yeah. We should make a watch that looks like that. Ooh. Okay. That's, that's the idea. So next safari time we talk, inspired watch. Next time we talk, let's, as you and me, share what we think customers want in watches. Love to. Okay. Everyone. Uh, this has been another episode of Spending Time, and I want to say thank you to our guest, Matthew Gallagher. His business is Watch Gang. It's a cool operation, and I think you should check it out, and we'll see you next time. A well-respected watch club. Very well-respected. <laughs> Bye, see guys. See you later.